Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Well, good evening. Tonight, as we devote our attention to the day in which Christ died on the cross as our substitute for sin, also known as Good Friday, we'll be considering the Bible's description of Jesus as the Lamb of God. To lead us into that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you tell us in Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, For just as rain and snow fall from heaven, you do not return there without saturating the earth, and making it germinate and sprout, providing seed to sow and food to eat. So your word that comes from your mouth will not return to you empty, but will accomplish what you please and will prosper in what you send it to do. Lord, with that in mind, I pray that as we examine what your word says about Jesus as the Lamb of God this evening, that we will allow your word to saturate our minds and hearts so it might accomplish your purpose in our lives today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Christians everywhere recognize the Lamb as a familiar biblical image. It's often connected with both Christmas and Easter. In regard to the Christmas story, lambs are not specifically mentioned, but they're implied by the presence of shepherds and also by the fact that Jesus was born in a stable. So even though the word lamb is not used in connection with Jesus' birth, we know there must have been many flocks in the area around Bethlehem. In regard to Easter, and in particular Good Friday, you see it's not really about a bunny. It's about all about a lamb, the Lamb of God. The Bible makes the connection between Jesus and lambs in several passages. Isaiah 53, 7 compares the Messiah to a lamb going to be slaughtered. John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God in John 1.29, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Apostle Paul called Christ our Passover Lamb in 1 Corinthians 5.7. And the Apostle Peter spoke of Christ's blood as the blood of a lamb without blemish or defect. And finally, the book of Revelation explicitly calls Christ the Lamb 30 times. You know, our emotional connotations for the word lamb are entirely positive based on its part, in part on its portrayal in Scripture. Compare that with the image of a snake that's used as a symbol for the devil. You now, children instinctively love lambs while most people fear snakes. The two animals are about as far apart on the emotional scale as you can get. In fact, the most effective rattlesnake anti-venom is actually made by immunizing sheep with snake venom. You see, sheep have robust immune systems, and they produce powerful antibodies that can bind to snake venom components, which enable our own immune defenses to eliminate these toxins. Even in the realm of science, you see, the lamb triumphs over the serpent. The story is told as it goes of a rattlesnake that bit one of my sheep in the face about a week ago. Deadliest snake that lives around here. The sheep's face swelled up and hurt her terribly, but the old rattlesnake didn't know the kind of blood that flows through the sheep. Anti-venom is often made from sheep's blood. The sheep swelled for about two days, but the blood of the lamb destroyed the venom of the serpent. I was worried, but the sheep didn't care. He kept on eating, kept on drinking, and kept on walking because he knew he was fine. You know, often the serpents of life will reach out and bite us. They inject their poison into us, but they cannot overcome the blood of the Lamb of God that washes away the sin of the world and the sting of death. So don't worry about the serpent or his bite. Just be sure to, that the Lamb's blood flows through your spiritual veins. You see, the blood of a lamb has destroyed the venom of the serpent. 
Well, in order, in order to understand the biblical picture of Jesus as the Passover lamb, we need to leave our modern world and journey back in time 35 centuries to the land of Egypt. There we discover that the Jews were being held as slaves by the Egyptians. For 400 years, the Jews had lived in harsh, difficult conditions. For generations, their labor had been exploited by cruel taskmasters. Well, finally, God raised up a leader named Moses. He went before the Pharaoh with a message from God, let my people go. Well, Pharaoh did not take this seriously, so Moses came back several times with the same message from God. But you see, Pharaoh had no intention of letting these slaves go free. So God devised a plan that would cause Pharaoh to beg the Jews to leave his land. He sent a series of terrible judgments called plagues on Egypt. Each plague represented a terrible natural disaster, and each one showed God's complete power over nature, and at the same time, they revealed the impotence of the false gods of Egypt. The ten plagues listed in order, as you see, are water into blood, frogs, gnats, flies, disease upon the livestock, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and death of the firstborn. Now God spared the Israelites in order to make a distinction between God's people and Pharaoh's people. Well, the ninth plague of darkness was a direct assault upon Ra, the sun god of Egypt. And since Pharaoh was considered the representative of Ra, this plague demonstrates that even Pharaoh was no match for the Almighty. And although these plagues inflicted severe suffering upon the people, Pharaoh hardened his heart against God. And instead of saying, you can go, he tried to make deals. First, he offered to let the Jews go a short door distance into the desert if they would promise to return. Then he offered to let the men go if the women and children stayed behind. Finally, he offered to let them all go, but leave their animals behind. Well, obviously, none of these options was acceptable. You see, friends, God does not make deals with pagan rulers. Finally, the moment had come for the tenth and final plague. We read in Exodus 11, 1, that the Lord essentially told Moses, don't worry, Moses, when this one hits Egypt, Pharaoh will be in a hurry to let you go. Well, at midnight on a certain night, the Lord would go through the land of Egypt, and every firstborn son in Egypt would die at that instant. He specified that no family would be excluded from Pharaoh's household to the home of the lowest Egyptian slave. God would even include the firstborn cattle in this judgment. In Exodus 12.30, we read that during the night, Pharaoh got up. He, along with all his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud wailing throughout Egypt because there wasn't a house without someone dead. But God would spare the Israelites in order to make a distinction between God's people and Pharaoh's people. And Exodus 12 reveals God's plan to spare the Israelites from a midnight massacre of the firstborn. He would spare his people by using the blood of a lamb. And when the blood of the lamb was sprinkled on the doorpost of each Jewish home, God would see the blood and would literally pass over that house. But if God did not see the blood, he would take the life of the firstborn in judgment. Well, it was the blood of the lamb then that saved the people of God that night. And every year since then, for 3,500 years and continuing to this very year, the Jews have observed a Passover celebration as a solemn reminder of God's amazing deliverance in Egypt. Well, even the minutest details of the Passover seem designed to point to Jesus Christ. There are several notable similarities between the events of the Passover 3,500 years ago and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the ultimate Passover for lamb. One of these is that it must be a lamb. Exodus 12:3 says that each man was to select a lamb for his own household. It could not be a bull or a dove, which were sometimes used in other Old Testament sacrifices. You see, God was very particular. It was to be a lamb and only a lamb. Nothing else would do. John 1, 29 says, when, Jesus, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, he cried out, look, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. 
In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. As I said before, the book of Revelation refers to Christ as a lamb in 30 separate instances. Secondly, it must be a male. Exodus 12, 5 specifies that animals you choose must be year-old males. Of course, Jesus fulfilled this in that he was the son born of the Virgin Mary. Another similarity is it must be a year-old lamb. This means that the lamb must be in its prime, neither too young nor too old. In a sense, even so, Christ offered himself in the midst of his days. He offered himself up, not in infancy, with the babies in Bethlehem. In Matthew 2, we're told that after the birth of Christ, that King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard that the wise men from the east were searching for the one who had been born king of the Jews. And after finding out that he had been born in Bethlehem, he gave an order to massacre all of the male children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. But prior to that, as you know, an angel of the Lord had appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him to take his, the child and his mother and flee to Egypt because Herod was about to search for the child to destroy him. Thus the baby Jesus' life was spared. Most historians say that uh, Jesus was in his mid-30s when he offered himself up to be sacrificed on the cross, which was in the prime of one's life. Half of the average lifespan back then, notwithstanding the high infant mortality rate. But number four, it must be without blemish. The Hebrew text in 12, Exodus 12, 5 uses a phrase that means without defect. The Hebrew word Tamim there means perfect or whole or complete in the sense of not having any blemishes or diseases. In other words, no physical defects. This means that the Jewish men would have to carefully inspect their lambs to make sure there were no open sores or, or patches or, or bare skin, no infections or diseases, no sickness of any kind. And this prevented a man from offering a lame or inferior lamb while keeping the best for himself. 1 Peter 1.19 picks up on this theme when it mentions Christ's blood being like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. Hebrews 4.14 4, and 15 emphasize that Christ was tested in every way as we are, and yet without sin. And in John 19, we're told that when Pontius Pilate finished examining him, he declared, I find no grounds for charging him. Even the hostile high priest could not find no just cause to put him to death, so they trumped up false charges against him. Well, it may be significant that the Passover lamb was selected on the 10th day of the month, but he wasn't sacrificed until the 14th day. Now, that allowed four days to carefully examine the lamb. If Christ then entered Jerusalem on Sunday and was crucified on Friday, then the intervening four days would fit the same pattern. And during those momentous days, the bitter enemies of Jesus used every possible tactic to discredit him. But each attempt utterly failed. They could not find even the smallest flaw in his character. Thus, even his worst enemies had to concede that he was fit to be a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Fifthly, it must be slain and roasted. Exodus 12 is quite clear on this point. All the lambs were to be slain at the same time and the blood drained from them. And then the carcasses were to be roasted and eaten whole. They were not to be boiled or eaten raw, which were pagan customs. Anything left over was to be burned. Thus the lamb was to be completely consumed. It's interesting that both the slaying and roasting picture the sufferings of Jesus on the cross. Not only did he die, but his death itself was a complete sacrifice. He died the, the uh, death of a criminal hanging on a hated Roman cross. It wasn't a noble death by any means. Socrates, uh, for example, drank poison. <laughs> that was considered a noble death, but uh, the humiliating death of a man rejected by the world that Jesus came to save was quite different. Another similarity between the two is that it must have no broken bones. 
We're told in verse 40, 46 of Exodus 12 that uh, when animals were chosen for the yearly Passover sacrifice, none of the bones were to be broken. And it was a custom of the Romans to break the legs of those being crucified in order to hasten their death. In John 19, we're told that the Roman soldiers did not break Jesus' legs because he was already dead. Verse 36 of that chapter points out that this happened to fulfill the scripture that says not one of his bones will be broken. And although the uh, quoted verse happens to be Psalm 34:20, the, the ultimate reference nonetheless goes back to Exodus 12. The seventh similarity is that it must be offered between the two evenings. Quite an unusual phrase. It's a literal translation of the Hebrew phrase found in Exodus 12, 6. Some translations say that the offerings were to be made at twilight or at sundown, but, but the words literally mean between the two evenings, which in Jewish thought meant between 3 and 5 p.m. The New Testament tells us that Jesus was crucified at the third hour, which would have meant 9 a.m., since the Jews reckoned time in 24-hour periods beginning at 6 a.m. Luke 23, 44 tells us that there was darkness from the sixth hour until the ninth, which would have been from 12 noon to 3 p.m. And shortly thereafter, Jesus uttered his final words and died. His body was then taken down from the cross before sundown. Thus, Jesus died between the two evenings, between 3 and 5 p.m., the exact hour that the Passover lambs were being sacrificed throughout Israel. Again, uh, Another similarity between the two, it must be sacrificed by all the people. Exodus 12 stresses that lambs must be offered by every man for every family in Israel. And all the lambs must be slaughtered at precisely the same time. Thus, the lambs represented the total population of the nation in the blood sacrifice. And by the same token, Christ was crucified by the Romans on behalf of the Jews. Everyone participated in his death. His death was made as a sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. What many lambs did for many people, you see, Jesus, the Lamb of God, did for all people. Another similarity is that the blood must be sprinkled. Again, Exodus is very specific in describing this ritual. Once the lamb had been slaughtered and the blood drained, the father must take some hyssop or a leafy bush and dip it in the blood and then put some of the blood on the top and sides of the door frame. And the blood would be then a sign that the family had sacrificed a lamb as the Lord had commanded. We're told in Exodus 12, 13, the blood on the houses where you are staying will be a sign or a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And this is this picture is not only the death of Christ, but our application of his death to our hearts by faith. And that's why 1 Peter 1 verse 2 speaks of the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. The Lamb of God, or the Lamb alone, could not save an Israelite. Not even a dead lamb could save. Not even the blood in the basin could save. Only the sprinkled lamb, or the blood on the doorpost, could spare the people from the terrible judgment of God. Just think of it this way for us. Jesus Christ is our only hope of salvation. He is God's lamb offered for the sin of the world. Jesus' blood saves, but only when it's received by faith. For those who reject the blood, even the lamb of God cannot save them. And finally, the meat must be fully consumed. Not only was the blood shed and the meat roasted, but the family was to eat the meat together with bitter herbs and unleavened bread, which was a reminder of their days in Egypt. They were not allowed to keep the meat for later use. Any part that wasn't eaten was to be burned. Thus, the Israelites signified their complete participation in the death of the lamb. His life was taken, his blood was shed, the blood applied, the meat roasted, and the meat consumed. And through these measures, you see, the Jews were reminded that their redemption came through the death of a substitute. The lamb died in their place, and by eating its meat, they signified their complete identification with the lamb who died for them. 
Well, the meaning for us is plain. Christ saves us when, as he himself said, eat his flesh and drink his blood by faith. Of course, he's figuratively speaking. Jesus used these very terms in John 6, verses 53 through 58. And he said this speaking not of, again, not of literal flesh and literal blood, but of what saving faith is all about. By the way, this is not a direct reference to the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, you see, is a memorial of Jesus' broken body and shed blood, as Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians 11. It's not the source of eternal life. For Old Testament Israel, the manna that God miraculously provided during the 40 years between the time they left Israel and entered the Promised Land was a temporary solution. You see, it could sustain life only one day at a time. To stay alive, the people had to keep eating that bread each day. And even then, the one who ate the manna eventually died. However, as Jesus said in John 6, 58, the one who eats this bread of life will live forever. In other words, the moment one eats the bread of life, he has everlasting life that can never be lost. Well, what are some lessons we can learn as believers for today? You know, from this ancient story, I believe we may glean four abiding lessons that apply to us. First of all, Jesus Christ is God's lamb. He's the only person who meets all the qualifications of the prophesied Messiah. He fulfills every detail of the Old Testament picture. No other person in the Bible meets these requirements. And since the lamb had to die in order for the blood to save, Jesus had to die, and his blood had to be shed. And this was the fate and appointed destiny of the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. Secondly, there is no salvation without sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22 reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. A living lamb, you know, might be cute and cuddly, but it doesn't save anyone. Unless the lamb dies, his blood does no good. And in God's economy, only shed blood can forgive sin. And as the great lamb of God, Jesus had to go to the cross in order to save the world. Third lesson, even Jesus cannot save one without faith. You know, some skeptics might say, this story is, seems absurd. But as believers in Christ, we know from God's word that it's true. Suppose an Israelite had refused to sacrifice a lamb. His firstborn would have died that night. You see, being a Jew could not save on that fateful night. It's not national origin that matters to God, but faith in God's appointed way of salvation. And the fourth lesson we can learn is that for those who refuse God's lamb, there is no other plan of salvation. Consider, for example, two men in Egypt on the afternoon before that fateful night. One is a good moral Egyptian, the other an immoral, dishonest Israelite. And somehow the two men have become good friends, despite many cultural differences. The Egyptian enjoys the friendship of the Israelite, even if he does not understand his strange religion. And the Israelite has seen many advantages of forging a relationship with a man from Egypt. So it was that they chatted together that day, the Israelite describing in some detail his plans to kill a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost. Only he sees no purpose in this strange thing. Why should he waste a perfectly good lamb, his best one, on such a useless endeavor? The Egyptian agree, agrees, but wonders all the while about the many terrible plagues that have befallen his native land. And they part promising to chat the next morning. That conversation never takes place. Later that afternoon, the Israelite keeps putting off, killing his best lamb. His wife pleads and begs, Sweetheart, it's time. Don't be too late. When the appointed hour comes, he kills the lamb, but not with any enthusiasm. He, he delays until the last moment putting the, lamb on the, the blood on the lamb on the doorpost. 10.30 comes and goes, and then 11, and the dear wife is fearful her husband will delay too long. And their four children, including the firstborn son, who looks much like his father, gather around the table. 11.30, and still the man delays. 11.45, and the man still has not done it. His wife weeps before him. How can you risk the life of your oldest son like this? So grudgingly, the man takes the hyssop and applies the blood to the doorpost. 
His wife smiles and is now satisfied because her family is safe. Midnight comes and goes and nothing happens. Not a sound is heard. However, in Egypt, wild screaming, shrieks, wailing, women crying, fathers shouting, death everywhere, death, firstborn sons and daughters dying in their sleep, firstborn cattle dying in their stalls. Not a family is left untouched by the death angel. In the home of the good and moral Egyptian man, sudden terror, then wailing. Their 15-year-old, the heir to their family business, their hope for their future, has suddenly stopped breathing. He dies so suddenly they don't even have time to say goodbye. Why did he die? Because there was no blood on the door. But what if the Egyptian had put blood on his door and the Israelite had not? Well then, see, the roles would have been reversed. You see, friends, it's the blood of the Lamb that makes a difference. For those who reject the blood, God has no other plan of salvation. We need a lamb, and we must trust in the blood of the Lamb of God for the forgiveness of our sins. We need a lamb. It must meet all the requirements laid out by God in Exodus 12. The lamb must die, and we must apply the blood to the doorposts of our hearts. That is, we must trust in the blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Well, where can we find such a lamb? We look to the cross. We gaze upon the blooding form of the Son of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb we need. He's God's Lamb for our sin. And we who know Christ as our Savior, having believed in Him alone for eternal life, can rejoice knowing the Lamb of God has been sacrificed for us. So we can rejoice this year on Easter Sunday, knowing that the baby in the manger was born to die. See, the road from Bethlehem leads to the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your only Son from heaven in this sin sinful world to die on a cross. Thank you that he came willingly and he suffered for us on our behalf, in our place. Thank you that he alone was qualified to atone for the sins of the whole world. And, and by faith in the, what he did in shedding his blood for our sins, Father, we can receive eternal life as a free gift. Help us to communicate this good news to people as we meet this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.